Okay, we're reading from Romans chapter 7 this morning, and we're going to read the entire chapter, and we're going to read right on over into uh, chapter 8, verse 4. <coughs> know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter." What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For if I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that do I not, and what, and what I hate that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good." Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members." O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body, from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free, from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his own holy inspired word this morning. This morning, this wonderful book of Romans, the first epistle of the New Testament, of course, was written by Paul, and of course, it is 
much is much of it is his testimony of his faith in Christ and of what Christ is to the Christian church, the head of the church. It, of course, was written to the Christian church, not just to the church at Rome. Uh, during the apostles' uh, third visit uh, to Corinth, and um, this local church at, at uh, Rome was composed of both uh, Jews and Gentiles who were believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, uh, its chief message, of course, is uh, the revelation of the righteousness of God uh, that imputes and imparts righteousness by the grace of God to all who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this righteousness is accomplished in the believer by the grace, by the grace of God through faith in Christ unto salvation unto eternal life. Now, this morning, righteousness cannot be attained by self-effort, or by keeping the law, uh, or by partaking of the ordinances, or even by being a good person and doing a lot of good works. Righteousness can only be attained by the power of the indwelling, living, resurrected Christ, who regenerates the human soul and gives to it a new nature. He moves us by the power of his spirit from being dead in trespasses and sins into a living relationship with the eternal God. And the Bible calls it being born again of the Spirit. It is the new birth that makes us acceptable to God, that we can stand in the presence of God, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and of course it is all because of the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ to us. Now, Jesus makes it very clear that except a man be born again, he cannot see, and neither can he enter into the kingdom of God. That man needs a spiritual birth. He needs to have his sins forgiven. He needs a change of heart. He needs a change of direction in his life. And of course, we call that conversion. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And this new birth is a work of grace. It is a gift from God. And this new gift from God can reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And that grace is a greater power than our sin. God's grace works within us a power over sin and over death so that we can positively say when we're born again that we have passed from death unto life. Now, Paul asks the church at Rome and for, 
throughout these next couple of chapters, he asks many questions. And then, of course, he answers the questions himself. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 2, he asks the church at Rome, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Those of us who are born again that have been forgiven, and we are to be delivered from the power of sin, how can we live any longer in the state of sin and under the power of death? In Romans 6.16, he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And of course, he's talking to the believers. And he exhorts them, he said, Do not yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I find in verse 22 and 23 of that chapter, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's an interesting thing that this passage of Scripture, we often use it in regards to the lost, the unsaved, the unconverted, and so forth, the unchurched. But you'll notice that this Scripture was not given to them. This Scripture was given to the Christian church at Rome. That the application was for the Christian church. That the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what we have this morning is every Christian is confronted with a choice of who he will serve whether he will be a servant of sin unto death or of God unto righteousness. Now, in Romans chapter 7, he asks another question. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And now he is speaking to those who know the law. And I take it from that this morning as we study the word, that he is primarily at this time speaking to Jewish believers. The Gentile believers, of course, would not be that acquainted with the law. But the Jewish uh, believers were certainly acquainted with the law. And uh, he is asking them the question that uh, how that the law will have dominion over a man as long as he lives. He says you should know that, that the law has dominion over a man as, as long as he lives. And, of course, we know that that's true. That as long as a man lives, that man is subject to the laws of God. He is subject to the laws of nature. He is subject to the laws of health. But when he dies, he becomes dead to the law that these laws do not have bearing on him after he is dead. And of course, Paul says, you know how that works. You understand that. Now, he talks to the Christian community that becomes dead to the law 
that when they become identified with the crucifixion and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that they identify with Christ and they become dead to the law. Now, this, this is an important issue that much of the Christian church never understands. In fact, this, this seventh chapter of Romans to many Christian people is a real conundrum. I, I talked to an evangelist when I was a young man, and he told me himself, he said, of all the books of the Bible, that he found the book of Ezekiel and the book of Romans the most complicated books of the scripture. To understand the relationship of law to grace and grace to law. Now, Paul makes it very clear that the law is good, that the law is holy, that it is of God, but it was given to man for the purpose to reveal to man his absence of righteousness. It was given to man to reveal to him his need of a savior. He needed help. He needed grace. He needed victory. Uh, under the law, man could find forgiveness of sin through the shed blood of animals. The atonement was made. But he did not have victory over sin. And so we find that he sinned and they sacrificed and he sinned and they sacrificed and he sinned and they sacrificed some more. And he could find pardon, he could find, he could find forgiveness of sins, but he could not find victory over sin, that he was always dominated by his sin and he sinned and he sinned and he sinned some more. And the reason was that law, the law had no delivering power. The law could not give eternal life. It could not give a God, the God life. It could not bring about a conversion. It could not bring about a new birth. That man was the same, continually sinning, and coming again, and again, and again. Now, the law given by Moses, of course, was a covenant of works. God was demanding of man good works, the keeping of the commandments. And of course, you and I know that man did not keep the commandments. And he did not keep the commandments because he could not keep the commandments. And anybody who's a Christian knows that in our own self-effort, we cannot keep the commandments, and we do not keep the commandments. There, there, it was a covenant of works. And the result was that sin continued in the nature, and the end result of it all was death. Sacrifices were offered continually, but there was no deliverance. There was forgiveness through the blood, but still no deliverance. Now, in Romans chapter 7, being dead to the law is further illustrated in what the Bible speaks of here as widowhood. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, and she is loosed from the law of her husband. 
And what we know from this is the marriage, of, the marriage relationship at death is dissolved. It's over. It's finished. She no longer lives under his law, under his rule. She no longer lives under his protection. She no longer lives under his benefits. Because that relationship is dissolved. And he goes on in verse 3, says, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. And the reason being is that she has broken the law. Because her husband is still alive. The marriage relationship is not dissolved. Uh, that it is, is still in effect. And says that she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And what we have here this morning, that when her husband dies, she's once again a free woman. She's a free woman. Now, the Bible tells us, Wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. And it's an interesting thing when we study this. There came a time when God's relationship to his people by the law ceased. And that day was when Christ died on the cross and he cried, it is finished. At that moment, the veil in the temple was rent in two. That relationship was finished. And if man is in a new relationship with God, it's no longer going to be by the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of the red heifer, the Aaronic priesthood, the holy of holies, the temple place to worship. God is finished. That is finished. That marriage is dissolved. It is finished. That relationship is done. And now, there is a new relationship that develops through Jesus Christ. Now, the crucifixion of Christ sets believers free from the law. Now, we need to recognize that the day that we believe in and on the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the day of our espousal to Christ. We become engaged to him. Now, in our economy, it's a little bit different than the Jewish economy. In the Jewish economy, when you had an espousal, and we call it an engagement, that was as binding as marriage itself. And if you broke that engagement, then that would be a case of adul adultery. And so the day you and I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we become a spouse to Christ. We are engaged to him. We become part of his property, as it were. He is, we're come under his leadership, his, his rule. Uh, he is our covering our protection, 
uh, we're not yet married to him because we, when we uh, come to the marriage supper of the Lamb, then, of course, that will be the great reception of the bride being presented to the bridegroom. And, of course, that is going to take place when he comes to pick up his bride. And then we're going to have a marriage. And we're going to have a reception, a great reception, in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But in the meantime, we are a spouse to him who has been raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We enter into a new relationship. And you'll notice that anybody who is married the second time, you'll notice that there are many, many changes that take place because you're under new leadership now. You have a different, different husband. And so there's many, many changes takes place. The old relationship offered sin and death. But the new relationship offers life, righteousness, peace with God, and so forth. Now, when we think about this new relationship, compared to the old relationship, one is deadness, and the other one, of course, is life, and it is freedom uh, that God has given to us through Christ much more freedom than we had under the law. The Bible calls it liberty. The Bible says that we need to stand fast in the liberty uh, that has been purchased for us on the cross of Calvary. The book of Galatians chapter 5 tells us that. But we are not to use that liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Now, this old relationship that led to sin and death, it exasperated sin. And we note that in verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now, isn't it an interesting thing that when God gave the children of Israel the commandments, in fact, it even began before that, when God told Adam, he says, everything is yours, but don't touch that tree. And Adam, of course, we know the end of the story, what he did. And you'll notice that when the commandments was come, and God says, don't do this, and don't do that, and don't do something else, that that's the very thing man's going to do. That he does. You notice, you notice this with, with our young people? We give them a lot of advice. Don't do this and don't do that and don't do that. And you know, if we didn't say anything to them, they wouldn't do it. But as soon as immediately we tell them not to do it, that's the very thing they'll go out and do. Do you notice that? You notice that? Why? Because of that rebellious nature that's on the inside. We're going to do it whether you like it or not. Hmm? And who's going to stop me? But there's one thing they have forgotten. That when they break the commandments, God has the last word. And the last word is death. Consequences. The scripture says, 
And I'm going to share this with you this morning, and I want you to get it. The scripture says, and we've, we've been involved with this for 50 years. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'll marry whoever I like. And they do. And it ends up in the courts. You can call the shots, but God will call the results. And the end of it will be destruction. And death is not always what we think death is, because we don't understand death. Death is none other than separation. When you and I die, our soul is separated from our body. When we die unsaved, we're separated from God. When our marriages die, we're separated from each other. When we go broke, we're separated from our property. Death means separation. And every time there's a death, with that death comes pain. We need to understand that. Now, in this new relationship, the Bible says that we should serve God in the newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. And this is an important thing for us as Christians to be able to understand. The scripture reminds us that the fruit of natural marriage, of course, is children. The Bible calls it the fruit of the womb. But the fruit of the mar our marriage to Christ is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's related to us in Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit. And there will be children. There will be children. There will be evidence. That will be part of the new creation. That will be the evidence that something actually has happened in the heart and the life of the person, that this person has been genuinely converted and changed. And of course, in our Christian churches today, we, we say, well, you pray this little prayer and invite Jesus into your heart and and then nothing has really changed. And then we, we give, give these lame excuses that, well, you know, they're just mere babes, yet we don't expect much from them and all this kind of thing. And it goes on and on and on. And there's no evidence of salvation whatsoever. When the Bible exhorts us that we need to be sure to make our election and calling sure. And the election, to make our election and calling sure the evidences of the new birth is a changed life. I'm sure we can all understand the difference of going to the cemetery and putting a body in the grave. We know what that is. But we'll be able to tell the difference between putting a body in the grave than on resurrection morning when that body comes out of the grave. And that's exactly what the Bible says. We have passed from death unto life. There's been a crucifixion and there's also been a resurrection. We buried the old man and a new man has come to life. We sprung up. We know the difference in the fall when the leaves begin to fall off the trees. And we know the difference now when we look out and new life is coming back into the trees. There's a difference between fall and spring. There's a difference between a funeral and a resurrection. And there's a difference in a life that was dead in trespasses and sins and a new life that has sprung up in Christ. A vast difference. One is new and fresh and the other one's dead. No hope, no life. Now, the Bible tells us here, you'll notice in verse 5 it says, when we were, 
That's past tense. That that part of our life is over. That we have passed from death and sin to life and righteousness. Now, Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And we should be able to discern the difference between flesh and spirit. That there's two different things. That which is born of the flesh is born in the image of Adam. By whom sin entered into the world. The fruit of Adam and Eve was children of disobedience. They're sons of Adam. You'll notice that many people say today, and I want to draw your attention to this, because it's a common saying, that man is created in the image of God. I want to point out to you that that's a bad saying. Because man is not created in the image of God. Man was created in the image of God. Man was, not is, was created. And you and I are not created in the image of God. For instance, God is righteous and holy. You are, and I are sinful and lost without God. Man is created in the image of Adam. We're not like God at all. That's what the whole purpose of, of the crucifixion and the resurrection is, is to make us like God. What the first Adam lost, the second Adam brings back. We're sons of Adam. We're born in the flesh. Now, that which is born of the Spirit is born in the image of Christ, by whom grace and truth and righteousness entered into the world. And his children are children of obedience, obedient to the faith. And the Bible calls them the sons of God. Isn't that marvelous? Marvelous? Turn, turn me with, with me in your Bibles this morning. In John, John chapter 1. Let's look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now you'll notice he doesn't say they are. He says he has given them the power to become. Now, when I look at, at Jeffrey over here, you can't say he's a man, because he's not, he's a child. But within him, he has the power to become a man. Give him some time, and he will be a man. But a lot of changes is going to take place in his life between now and then. When you and I are born again, you and I have the potential to become the sons of God. To become like Christ. And there's going to take a lot of changes in our life over a period of time. Now, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. 
Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And this being led by the Spirit of God is talking about being developed by the Spirit of God, being controlled by the Spirit of God, and they're led by the Spirit of God. As many. Now that doesn't mean everybody's going to be, but as many as are, are as, as will be led by the Spirit, they will become the sons of God. All right, let's go to First John. First John chapter three. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in, himself, in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And what's that mean? That all these impurities and sins, they're going to be wiped out. We're going to be delivered from. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And every Christian has got a lot of lingering sins in their life that is controlling their life and in many respects destroying their life. Because they do not live in victory. And we're going to show you that this morning. Now, this morning... Paul asks another question in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. He says, is the law sin? Is the law sin? And of course, the answer to uh, that question this morning is, uh, God forbid. And the thought here this morning that Paul is suggesting that uh, because there is the law, is the law identical with sin? Is the law the cause of sin? And the answer to that, of course, is God forbid. And he tells us here, he says that he had not known sin, but by the law. Now, I, I, I mentioned this before, that, that if there's a, an intersection, and of course there's no stop sign, you know, it's a good thing on these intersections, whether there's stop signs or not, is at least to slow down and maybe even stop, and especially if people are coming, that there's going to be a collision in the, stops, in the, in, in the intersection. And of course, if you drive through the intersection, it's fine. But immediately, as soon as they put up a stop sign, and you drive through the stop sign, you've broken the law. And that's what Paul says. He said, you know, there was no stop signs. And you'll notice that in the book of Romans, and I believe it is chapter 5, that, that chapter 4, that says that where there is no law, there's no transgression. So Paul says that he had not known sin until the law came. And of course, that was the purpose of the law, was to bring the knowledge of sin. And the law brings sin to light. The law brings sin to light. Now, it's an interesting thing. The scripture tells us as well, uh, back in, uh, I believe it is, uh, uh, where he says that where there is no law that God does not impose 
putes him. Um, in verse uh, 13 of chapter 5, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. So from Adam to Moses, God did not charge people with sin because there was no law. But as soon as the law came, then sin was charged to them because sin was brought to light. It was there all along. But the people were not aware of it. The law brings sin to light. You know, I believe the re one of the reasons why we have so little conviction of sin today is because we do not teach the commandments of God. What God expects of man. And back in the 60s, we come to the conclusion that the churches were too old and too stuffy and too legalistic and too this and too that and too something else. And we want to be liberated. So then all of a sudden, we picked up this line that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. So that means that because we're under grace and under liberty, that we can do whatever we like. And this is where we're at today. And this is the very thing that our fathers was very afraid of. And it has come to pass. Just because we're under grace, we have forgotten that grace establishes the law. God hasn't changed his mind. God hasn't changed his mind about taking his name in vain. God hasn't changed his mind about working on Sunday. God hasn't changed his mind about stealing or immorality or any of those other things. God hasn't changed his mind. But when the law brought sin to light, Paul says it wrought in him all manner of cupiscence. Oh, he began to look into his life and he saw a lot of black things in his life that he never saw there before. And you know what the law did? It condemned him. And he felt guilty before God. And that's exactly what it was supposed to do. And it is that guiltiness by the law that is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. He says, for without the law, sin was dead. It wasn't evident. He was not aware of it. But when that, that law came, all of a sudden, Paul became conscious, conscious of sin. He said that without the law, he was alive. He had no conscience of sin. But when the law came, Sin was revealed, the sentence of death followed, and Paul says, I died. I died. Worthy of death, because he'd broken the law, the law of God. Now, he goes on to say, the commandment which was ordained to life, verse 10, I found to be unto, de unto death. The very thing that was supposed to help me condemned me. It was to be for my good, but it was ordaining my death. This is a tremendous thing. You'll notice he said, for sin by taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. He said, I thought it was going to give me life. And instead it brought me death. Now, it's an interesting thing that the whole Jewish nation, they thought that this law was going to give 
to them life. And they prided themselves in Moses and the law. And when Christ came, they just couldn't get over that. But they didn't understand that the very law that was given to them by Moses was condemning them. Because they were constantly breaking the law. And what did God say of those people? He says they're hard-hearted, they're stiff-necked, and he said they're very rebellious. And isn't that the truth of the matter? You know, when you're driving down the highway and there's no posted signs, most people die, drive pretty sensibly and reasonably. But as soon as you put up that sign 100 kilometers an hour, immediately then you want to go to 120 or 130 or whatever. Or if they have a sign going through the town 50 kilometers, that's the speed limit, immediately you want to drive 60, you see. Because it's rebelling against God. And that's what the law does. It causes us to rebel against God. And isn't that the very story of the Garden of Eden? God says, everything, Adam, is yours. But don't touch that tree. Adam went out and he did it. And what did he do? He rebelled against God. And every one of his children is born with that rebellious nature. And as soon as we bring the commandments into place, <laughs> I think of little kids. You know, you can have a, years ago we had a hot stove in the house. The kids would be playing around there and never touch it. But immediately, as soon as you tell them, don't touch the stove because you're going to get burnt, they've got to go over and touch it. Hmm? You notice that? You know, I had to learn that lesson the hard way. You know, it was a very frosty day. And my dad told me, he says, you know, don't put your tongue on the pump. So I just walked over and put my tongue in the pump, and you guess what? It was stuck right on. If he would have never said that, I would have never even thought of it. Hmm? I remember being in a camp meeting years ago when this drug business, uh, gasoline sniffing and all was going on. And we had an evangelist out of the big church in Toronto was speaking that morning. And of course, parents were standing up and the preachers were standing up warning our young people against drugs. And I never forget that fellow. He says, that's the worst message we can ever give them. If we'd never said anything about drugs, most of those kids would never even have known anything about drugs. But as soon as we started to tell them don't take drugs, they got to go out and try it and experiment with it. You see. Now, Paul says that the law was holy. It was just. It was good. And of course it was spiritual because it was given to, by God to, for the good of man. It was to be a lamp under our feet and a light under our pathway. It was designed or ordained to be to life, to reveal the path of righteousness for us. But because of sin in us, it became a sentence of death. Sin, working death in us, uses the law as a weapon against us in order to that through the commandments, the wickedness and the immeasurable sinfulness of man might, be, might plainly appear, the Bible says. Now, the law in essence itself is spiritual. And it has been given to us to reveal ourselves to ourselves. How many people think they're pretty good people? Do you know that's a deception? Because the Bible says there's none good, no, not one. You remember 
And the man that came to Jesus and said, good master. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that's God in heaven. But we have the concept we're a good man. Do you know the hardest people to get saved is good people? Because they think they're good. They think they're good enough. The Bible says we're not. The Bible says we're sinners. Who likes to be called a sinner? Who likes to hear the truth? And the churches that are preaching the truth have few people in them. There's the old saying, truth hurts. Truth hurts. I know when my wife tells me the truth. But given for our, that we reveal ourselves to ourselves, reveals to us that we're Adam's seed. That we're carnal, unspiritual, earthly minded, sold into slavery, under the control of sin. A sinner cannot be saved by trying to keep the commandments. Neither can a Christian live a righteous, godly, holy life by keeping the commandments. That would be self-effort and that would be a covenant of works. And we are under a covenant of grace. The Bible says not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That righteousness is obtained by the grace of God through faith. And that's the only way it can be attained. Now, in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, uh, th this is a particular passage of scripture that's very difficult to understand. And uh, I, I note I've read it through it many times. Because it is the passage of scripture that speaks of a defeated Christian life. I've said this a number of times. You know... We need to recognize that our verses and chapters and so forth, that they are not inspired. And they were put there by the translators. So it was easy for us to find. And they made a mistake in placing the chapters the way they do, a particular here, because at the end of chapter 7, Paul is a very defeated man. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. A very defeated man. But Paul is simply didn't want to stop there. Paul didn't want to stop till he got to the end of verse 4 in chapter 8, where he comes out of a defeated Christian life into a victorious Christian life in Christ, where the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. That Paul is no longer striving with sin. He's got the victory. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believes Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, they're not of God, they're of the world, and our victory this morning is in Jesus Christ, not in keeping the law, and we win the victory by the Spirit. Shall we pray? Father, this morning again, we thank you for the good word of God. And Father, we're so prone to fall back into the bondages of the law and use this element of trying to be good, trying to keep the commandments, trying to live a Christian life. And we falter and fail and fail and fa uh, fail. 
and really never get the victory over sin in our life because we're using an element of self-effort. And our victory is not in the law. Our victory is...